Hi everyone, welcome to another episode of iGrow's Marketer of the Month. I'm your host, Dr. Saksham Sharda. I'm the creative director at outgrow.co. And for this month, we're going to interview Claire Salentrop, who is the co-founder and COO at Forget the Funnel. Thanks for joining us, Claire. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So Claire, we're going to start with a rapid fire round just to break the ice. You get three passes. In case you don't want to answer a question, you can just say pass. But try to keep your answers to one word or one sentence only, okay? Okay, let's do it. All right, so the first one. Godfather or Star Wars? Godfather. How many hours of sleep do you need to function? At least seven. <laughs> <laughs> What's your favorite carb? Bread, pasta, rice, or potatoes? Mm, I have to say bread. That's a good one, though. <laughs> <laughs> Most embarrassing moment of your life? All of high school? <laughs> <laughs> okay, cringe. What does the acronym SCUBA stand for? I have no idea. Pass? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's your ideal outside temperature? Ooh, se about 75 Fahrenheit. Okay, right. and if, mm -hmm. <laughs> if everyone in the world had to get married when they reached a certain age, what would that age be? Old as possible. <laughs> okay. Favorite type of muffin? Chocolate. Mm -hmm. The city in which the best kiss of your life happened? Ooh, what a good question. Uh, probably New York. <laughs> Okay. The first movie that comes to your mind when I say the word ambition. Uh, what is that? What's the always be closing movie? Um, uh, <laughs> I can't remember the name. <laughs> <laughs> okay, we're just going to leave it there. A <laughs> habit of yours that you hate. Probably how often I say um. <laughs> <laughs> Your favorite Netflix show? Uh, Tuka and Bird. He <laughs> <laughs> okay. just went, oh, again. So I was just like, okay, that's too soon after the previous question. But uh, yes, that was the end of the rapid fire round. You had two passes, I think, or two oh, no. places where you didn't quite answer, which means that you score eight and 10, which means you only win a car. Just kidding. You don't win anything. Oh, but. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So the long form questions. The first one is, what are the different skill positions on your marketing team? What advertising platforms and target audiences have you found to be the most effective for SaaS? Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> so I'll try to break those down. So uh, what are the, you said, what are the skill sets on our marketing team? Yeah, different, different skill positions on your marketing team. Mm -hmm. So our marketing team is pretty small. Uh, our, our company overall is about, um, well, myself and my co-founder full-time, uh, and by full-time, we, we do a four-day work week, um, so four days a week, and then the rest of our team is very flex. Um, overall, though, we are about seven people, um, and at any given time, I'd say probably about three of us are, uh, are working on marketing. So our core skill sets are strategic planning, for sure. Um, so we we take a very customer led approach to everything we do. Um, so under like uh, customer research and insights gathering is a, a key skill set that's important to us. Um, and then strategy development from gathering those insights is really important. And then in terms of marketing, I guess, channels or, or expertise on the actual demand side, uh, co-marketing. So like partnerships are a major play for us. Um, that's a major skill set. Email, uh, email marketing and automation um, is a major skill set for us. And then um, I guess thought leadership is probably the best way to phrase um, our, our third most important skill set. In other words, um, having an opinion about how marketing should run and being vocal about that opinion is probably our, our biggest third skill set. Um, in terms of platforms that we've seen work, um, for SaaS companies, this is so, this is such a, a it's going to be an annoying, it depends question, um, right? Because it's going to entirely depend on 
who the target audience of that SaaS platform is. So some companies that, that our team works with, um, we were a, a SaaS consulting firm just for helpful context. Um, we've worked with folks uh, who run SaaS companies that target heavily B2B enterprise customers. For them, something like LinkedIn advertising is going to be probably the most effective. Um, leveraging tools like ad roll, of course, um, are going to be important. Um, but what they're advertising is going to be just as important, right? Um, so oftentimes what we're helping them do is um, not just identify what channels will be most effective, but also what messaging is most effective. Um, so that, that might be a good outlet for, again, someone targeting enterprise customers, B2B space. Um, in other situations, for companies targeting more uh, self-serve customers um, and are, who are going for a more high volume play, um, you know, paid advertising isn't necessarily always going to be what scales forever. Um, in those cases, sponsoring podcasts that their customers listen to or appearing in newsletters uh, is going to be more effective. So it really depends on the customer you're trying to serve and where they go uh, to look for new solutions um, as much as your product and, and your pricing model. So I recognize that's not a super flat answer, but <laughs> hopefully it was helpful. And speaking of thought leadership, then your title is SaaS Marketing and Growth Advisor. Is there a distinction between growth marketing and marketing in general? Isn't all marketing about growth? That's a fantastic question. I would agree with you that all marketing is growth. Um, there's, there, there really isn't a differentiation between growth and marketing, but we have learned that our target audience, which is uh, founders and execs within SaaS companies do sometimes look at, look at them as different practices. Um, so a lot of, a lot of SaaS founders, when we first start speaking with them, they think of marketing as, uh, like brand awareness. Um, and they think of growth as more of the metrics, more of the spreadsheet type marketing. So we use growth and marketing advisor because that's the messaging that we've found resonates with who we are trying to target and who we speak to, even though, yes, internally, I would agree with you 100% that it's all the same. <laughs> and so when it comes to growth strategies of all sorts, if a company follows a product led growth strategy, how can they transform customers into promoters? Mm, super good. How can they transform customers into promoters? Well, there are a couple of, how much time do we have? <laughs> oh, you can keep talking. It's fine. There's no, there's no limit, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> so, uh, there's actually a very specific process we follow to help companies, uh, companies with a product led approach do exactly that. So, um, the general high level steps are first identifying within their current customer base. Who are those current best customers who already love their product and would happily promote it to others? Typically, we categorize those customers by um, one, they're highly engaged. So they're using the product on an ongoing basis and getting value. Um, and they've become customers. In other words, they started paying within the past six months to a year um, because we want to we want to identify customers who purchased recently and are going to remember what their buying journey was like. Um, so identifying their best customers is step number one to doing that. Step number two is actually learning from those customers via interviews and surveys. We have a very specific survey that we typically use. Um, not just, you know, what do they like about the product, which is helpful information, but what led them to seek out a new solution like this product. Um, so, for example, uh, we just started working with a company that offers um, a very product-led uh, solution. It's a, it's a meditation app, right? Very consumer focused. There's no sales involved. It's all product-led. Um, and they're, they, even though they're a pretty small name, they have thousands of paying customers um, in a market that's very saturated. There's other much bigger brands of meditation apps out there. So when we start working together, the first thing we'll, we'll look to uncover from their customers is why this one over any others? Why this one over Headspace? Why this one over Calm? What led you to choose, what led you to seek out and finally choose this particular product? So in doing that, 
identifying the best customers, learning why they bought, um, we can then understand what makes this product competitive and superior to others in the space in the eyes of best customers. Not internally what we think their competitive differentiators are, but what do their customers say they are. And when we do that, we can then zoom out and kind of put ourselves in the shoes of those best customers and walk through their customer's buying journey. So we can use products like uh, Spark Toro, uh, it's an audience research tool, to go to the sources where their target customers spend time, listen to the podcast they listen to, watch the YouTube channels they watch, um, read the blogs they read. And then we can go to the product website, or in this case, the app store. And knowing what customers said was really valuable, we can see, hey, does this company actually promote those most uh, important features on their site? Do they highlight their competitive differentiators in a way that matches what their customers say? Um, and if not, then we see opportunities to improve messaging, positioning, um, and then we get into the product itself, right? So we sign up and we, we look around and we say, okay, is it easy to find the things that customers said were most important within this product? Are there opportunities to make that onboarding experience and getting to the aha moment easier? And then finally, naturally, um, once, once we've gone all the way through the customer journey to the moment where they receive value, then we're looking at, hey, are we, is this company proactively asking those ideal customers to leave a five-star review? Um, are we asking customers to spread the word to a friend? Um, are we asking customers, hey, who do you know who might love this meditation app as well? Um, so there are, I guess I laid out um, three of the steps there. Identify your best customers, learn why they bought, understand where the opportunities are to better leverage those best customers. And then of course, of course, the fourth is implement the plan, right? Um, actually leverage that as a, as those, those ideal customers as a growth channel, um, both by asking them to leave reviews, asking them to refer friends, but also by taking their words and applying customers language to the product's messaging and positioning to better attract more people like them. Um, so that was my kind of roundabout <laughs> way of leveraging ideal customers in product led growth. So besides Park Toro, what other marketing channels or tools do you think one needs to perfect in order to send the right message to the right person at the right time? What other tools? Um, marketing channels. You can also talk about channels in general. Up to you. Yeah. Um, really, I, I don't want to sound like a broken record, but it, it, always, it always depends on what we hear from those ideal customers. Um, and that's always a little bit different. So in the B2B space, the channels that we often see uh, that are most effective are, well, we already chatted about LinkedIn, um, but then um, any type of industry, um, news sources, uh, publications, um, existing thought leaders and, and partnering with existing thought leaders in those spaces is very effective. Um, so on the other end of the spectrum, if we're on the um, heavily consumer side, um, really common uh, channels like Instagram ads or other social media ads can work to an extent. Um, we are seeing though that, excuse me, we are seeing though that the biggest, the biggest most saturated channels only scale so far. Um, and then you really do need as a company to start relying on channels more like partnership marketing, right? So. Um, finding other brands or influencers in your audience's space that already have their attention, um, leveraging not just YouTube ads, but partnerships, um, cr creating partner content. Um, so really, I guess if I had to summarize it, it's not just paid channels like LinkedIn or others or consumer social platforms, but it's also content marketing itself. That's really, um, even though content marketing has been a concept that's been around for decades, it's something that's clearly still not going away. Um, and the more that a company can understand what existing content creators its its customers love, um, and the more it can establish partnerships with those creators, uh, the, the more likely you are to reach and resonate with your audience. And so once you have this top of the funnel traffic, how can you deliver value to do, to those that have the intent of like, you know, finally buying your product or service? 
how can you deliver value? I think it depends on how, how long or short your ideal customer's buying journey is. So as an example, again, speaking to the uh, product led state, uh, to the product led approach, um, I recently bought a, uh, a treadmill for under my desk. Um, I do a lot of sitting <laughs> as many of us do who work in tech. Um, and of course it's a smart treadmill and it comes with an app. Um, and when I purchased the treadmill and downloaded the app, my, my journey to getting value was super short. All the app had to do was turn on the treadmill and help me adjust my speed. Done. <laughs> Pretty short buying journey. Um, so there wasn't a lot that that company needed to do in terms of onboarding. Um, it was very straightforward, very much unlike, let's say, uh, onboarding into a new project management software or onboarding into a new, what else is a, a highly complex thing to do? Um, a new marketing automation tool, migrating from an old marketing automation tool to a new one. Um, what those types of companies are going to need to do to provide value is much more complex and will probably require several different steps. Um, so the first indication that their customers might be getting value are that um, they're seeing an increase of uh, not just traffic to their site, um, but also an increase in visits to signups for their free or their trial product. That would indicate that they've reached a, a point in their positioning and messaging at which they're resonating with the pain that their ideal customers feel um, and actually conveying that, yes, we can help solve this pain. So that'd be one way of assessing whether or not they're creating value is that they're, they're hitting, they're hitting customers with the right message. And then next stage, um, would be once free users have gotten inside of their product. Um, what is the first moment that not just the customer took a step, but that they actually, um, they actually saw in their own life, okay, Hey, this product will work for me. I'm trying to think of a good example of that. Um, Okay, great example. Uh, in my many years ago now, um, my final in-house role was as the number two hire and the director of marketing at Calendly. Um, someone signing up for a, a Calendly account um, would begin with putting in their email address and connecting the product to their calendar. Um, but that doesn't inherently mean that the new user got value. Having a scheduling tool connected to your calendar doesn't provide value in and of itself. The product wasn't actually valuable to someone until they had their first meeting scheduled through it. So we tracked product activation, not by someone signing up and connecting their calendar, but by someone signing up, connecting their calendar and getting their first meeting scheduled. So looking at that moment, um, based on when your customers say they, they understood the value is how you'll be able to track that. It's always different based on what your product is and what your customers say the moment of value was. Um, so that's where, when I mentioned earlier that we're customer led, that's where that customer centricity comes in is by evaluating your, your internal measure measurements based on what your customers say was valuable. Hmm. So to sum it all up, to what extent would you say that the more your company's attention is focused on outcomes important to your customers, the CPIs, the better your company will likely perform on outcomes important to the business KPIs. 100%. That was the perfect story. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got to disagree with it a little. Like, give us a little. <laughs> I know you 100% agree with it, but what would be the flip side if you had to? What would be the drawbacks? What would be the, uh, you know, uh, hypothetical argument against this sentence? argument against being customer centric. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Well, just, uh, just as a thought experiment, even, even though you don't believe in that, sure. but still. <laughs> yeah. Let me think through that. Um, well, this isn't necessarily an argument against it, but I can describe what we do often see happen out in the real world, which is uh, when we start working with companies, typically the, the KPIs that they've used to define their internal success were defined kind of based on guesses, um, kind of based on this is what we think will move the needle for our product and our company, but we don't really know. Um, so I would say that well-intentioned guesses are probably the opposite end of the spectrum from customer-led KPIs. Um, for example, it's super common for us to start working with a team in which 
Um, they have a they have someone responsible for traffic. They have someone responsible for MQLs and then uh, maybe SQLs or PQLs and so on, um, because that's what they've been told they're supposed to be measuring. But oftentimes, even though they they say, okay, we track MQLs and then SQLs. Um, it's common for us to then ask teams, okay, well, how do you define an MQL versus an SQL? Um, and different teams will have different definitions. People within the company sometimes don't actually don't actually have a formal definition. Um, so well-intentioned guesses um, are problematic, one, because people don't really know how to then impact those, those metrics. Um, and two, because they can actually cause some tension between teams if marketing is is defining MQL the same way that sales is defining an SQL. Um, it creates tension, creates infighting, it creates confusion um, versus measuring the team success based on what defines customer success. Um, so again, that's not necessarily an argument against, against being customer led, but it is what often happens when a company is young and still figuring out what KPIs even matter. Okay. So the last question is leaving all customers and KPIs aside, what would you be doing if not this in your life right now? Wow. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> um, what would I be doing? I would, I would be doing something outside. <laughs> um, so my, my brother-in-law, for example, he works in, um, he works in like landscaping and gardening. He's outside in nature all day long. Um, he really loves that. Um, I, in my spare time, um, have a bunch of flowers like all around our house that I tend to, um, being out in the world, uh, versus, um, versus being in tech and on the computer, it's like the different ends of the work spectrum. Um, so since my, since my day life is all about being on devices, if I weren't doing this, I would be 100% off of devices. <laughs> Okay, fair. That's all. That's every, that's the one thing everyone wants to do in the post-pandemic freedom that we're all going to get, hopefully. <laughs> okay. Well, thanks everyone for joining us for this month's episode of Upgrow's Marketer of the Month. That was Claire Salentrop, who is the co-founder and COO at Forget the Funnel. Thanks for joining us, Claire. Thank you so much for having me. Check out their website for more details and we'll see you once again next month with another Marketer of the Month. <laughs>